Hello, everyone, and welcome to this orientation webinar for the Future Park Leaders of Emerging Change Internship Program. My name is Larry Perez. I'm your moderator for the session today. And in just a moment, we're going to introduce all the panelists that you'll be meeting during today's broadcast. But before we get started, right off the bat, I wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded for future reference and will be shared with you in turn. Additionally, I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into how the webinar panels work. All the functionality for today's webinar is contained within the tiny toolbar that you'll see on your desktop now. And in case the panels aren't already expanded, you can expand them all using this tiny orange button at the top of the toolbar. Know that by default, some of your panels may periodically collapse, but you have control over that. In order to keep panels from collapsing, you can simply tap on View at the top of the menu and deselect the Auto Hide the Control Panel menu item. You're going to have opportunities today to ask questions of the future park leaders, uh, administrators, and former alumni that we have with us. In order to do so, there's two functionalities you can use. There is a raise your hand function. If you raise your hand, we'll be monitoring that. And we'll have opportunities in today's broadcast to potentially bring your voice into the room, unmute you, and allow you to ask your question directly. Just know, by default, everybody online today, due to the number of participants, is muted by default but raising your hand will give us a cue that you want to bring your voice into the room. But the key way to ask your questions is using the questions panel at the very bottom of the webinar interface. You can enter questions at any time during today's presentation, and we'll be monitoring them and bringing them up to our presenters as opportunities allow. And just so you know, we'll have a pretty robust opportunity for Q&A at the very tail end of the presentations, but enter your questions at any point in time. With that, I want to go ahead and turn things over to Jessica Johnson to do some introductions for us as we get started today. All right, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, my name is Jessica Johnston, and I think Larry's trying to switch me over, but I am the Education Program Coordinator with the Ecological Society of America. And I think I'm, at, there we are, here I am. Um, if you guys don't know what the ESA is, we're a partner with the Future Park Leaders alongside of the National Park Service. Uh, we're a nonprofit society with over 9,000 members. We have a huge annual meeting every year, and we are huge uh, proponents of ecological education, and um, we also run a couple journals. In addition to me, today on the call is Melanie Wood. Uh, say hi, Melanie. Nope, she's not there. Hi. Oh. There, there she is. Uh, she is uh, the project manager from the National Park Service side. And finally, our very special guest, Yvonne Bermejo, who is a park guide at Great Basin National Park and a former FPL intern who we'll talk to later. Um, all right, so moving into the agenda. On today's agenda, we have, uh, we will broadly cover the, um, the details of the, Future Park Leaders Program. We will also talk about the 2020 projects and where to find the full project description. Um, we will also cover eligibility requirements since we know that this can be a bit confusing to some. Uh, we will go over program benefits, both from the intern's perspective, but also from the National Park Service perspective. Uh, we will discuss what is a direct hire authority? Um, how is it helpful? How does it work? Uh, very important application tips, so please pay attention to those. Um, then we will also hear from Yvonne about his experience as an intern. And finally, we will finish with the student-led chat session, as Larry discussed in the beginning. All right, so um, the focus of the future, program, the future Park Leaders Program is to place about a dozen interns into a park each year with projects that are designed to be highly rigorous and challenging since it is intended to address new and novel management challenges unique to each park. Um, some of the project categories are very broad and will cover things like climate change, uh, microplastic ocean pollution, and also um, threats to the dark night skies. And they're always usually re resource focused on things like so natural resources, cultural resources, um, facilities, and visitor use. Um, 
the important thing to note is that every project is unique. And if you look at this map here, you can see that the projects are strewn all across the U.S. and its territories, all the way from the war in the Pacific in Guam and to Everglades National Park. Um, of these projects, each project is different. So if you look at the title slide, if you mind switching to the next slide for me, awesome. You'll see every single project title is different and every single project lead is a different person. Um, it is important for you guys to know that if you haven't already checked it out, you should definitely go to the full detailed project descriptions that are on our website page under the available internships. Um, there is a link at the top of the screen that'll take you to the available internships. But basically what's important to know is that uh, if you don't read the details of each project description, then you won't actually know what is expected of you. Um, next, we'll move into the eligibility requirements. So the key note thing here is that applicants must be students. So if you're an upper level undergraduate student enrolled in a degree seeking program, you are eligible under certain circumstances. Number one, if you are a junior by January 2020, so by the close of the application period, if you are a junior by credit hour, then you are eligible to apply for this program. Or if you are a senior, but you're not graduating before summer 2020. I know this is kind of tricky because a lot of people tend to graduate in May, you know, but if you graduate before then, then you won't be eligible unless you are applying to be a graduate student. So this is the unique opportunity. We understand that sometimes people jump straight from seniors into graduate school. So they'll have that summer off. So if you have that summer off, but you are enrolled in graduate school for fall 2020, then you are eligible for this program. Um, or if you are enrolled in not graduating as a graduate student, either master's or PhD, you're also eligible for summer 2020. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Melanie. Oh, I forgot one, sorry. Uh, you also have to be a US citizen. Um, this program is DHA required, which Melanie will talk to you about more in depth later on. But unfortunately, if you're not a citizen or U.S. national, you will not be eligible for this program. Okay, thank you, Jessica. I'm going to turn on my webcam so you guys can see me. And let's talk a little bit about the benefits of the Future Park Leaders program. So it is full-time work for 12 weeks at $16 an hour. You are paid as an employee of the Ecological Society of America. Housing is provided at no or very low cost to you. So that's in addition to your hourly pay, um, you're provided housing. Housing is often park housing, a, a dormitory at a local campus, uh, a room in an apartment sublet. It, it really is pretty flexible and dependent on the unique circumstances of the park in which you're located. But it should not cost you money. Um, you will get on-the-ground work experience while working with iconic national park resources that would create a very rewarding and memorable experience. You get to spend time with uh, natural resource and cultural resource land management professionals where you build this network of, uh, of other scientists um, and non-scientists that you can have contact with for the rest of your life. Uh, you get to have time to develop and explore your career goals uh, through park mentorship. This is a really important component of this program, is creating the space to think about what your short and long-term career goals are. Every intern participates in a mandatory end-of-summer professional development workshop. This is a place where you go to present the findings of your project, interact with uh, professionals in your field, and learn about what it means to uh, be in federal service. And you are eligible for the Direct Hire Authority, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail here. The Direct Hire Authority, all Future Park Leaders internships fall under a special personnel bulletin called the Direct Hire Authority for Resource Assistant Internship Program. This authority allows students who complete a Future Park Leaders project and graduate to be hired non-competitively into a federal permanent position without competition. Many or most 
uh, permanent federal positions are competed broadly among the American public, and this creates an exception in which we are able to select a student who has the DHA hiring authority and place them into a vacancy. This is not a guarantee. This is just an opportunity if you are working with uh, a supervisor or hiring manager in the park service that they can place you into one of these positions. Uh, okay, I can take more questions on DHA in the questions box. It can get kind of complicated, but right now I want to move into some application tips. There are really great things to do when you're applying for a position and there are things you do not want to do. So, number one thing is to read everything very carefully. Read the project description to which you are applying. Jessica talked about how there is a PDF for each of the 12 positions on the futureparkleaders.org website. Read the qualifications, read the tasks, know the project to which you are applying. Read the website, make sure you are eligible, make sure you understand the requirements and the benefits, and read the application system instructions. Write great essays. You have three short essays in your application system. The first one asks you to describe how well qualified you are for the projects that you're applying to. You are allowed to apply to up to three projects, and you describe your how your experience and skills match those projects in that first essay. Make sure that the skills and experience you are highlighting in the essay are directly relevant to the project to which you are applying. They do not want to hear about skill sets that are maybe really amazing and impressive but don't relate at all to the project. And then most importantly, anything you mention in your essay, make sure it is very easy to find on your resume or your CV. The second essay speaks to your career aspirations. So we evaluate candidates not just on how well qualified they are to complete the work, but on how interested you are in a career in federal land management. We are looking to invest in students who want to work for the rest of their lives, possibly in this effort. So speak to your career aspirations for national parks and for public land management in general. And then the third essay uh, gets at your experience managing projects, working in a team, and working independently to meet goals. These are all very challenging projects. There's a lot to accomplish in a short amount of time. So we want to see that you are up to the task, that you can work independently, that you are well organized, and that you have examples of how you have accomplished or demonstrated these skill sets in past projects. Okay, write a great resume or CV. Don't be uh, limited to one or two pages as is the general way. We don't need a one-page resume here. A CV is more common. Even a federal resume is acceptable, but don't worry about page limit. We want to see more detail than less. Make it easy for us to see the coursework, skills, and experience that is relevant to the projects to which you are applying. So if you have coursework that you've taken that's relevant, put it at the top. Make sure that if you have a lab experience or field experience, any other internship projects, theses, et cetera, et cetera, volunteer, um, that you put that up high and very clearly in your resume. Don't make us hunt for it. Uh, increase your chances to become a top candidate by considering less famous parks. Everyone's going to apply for the U.S. and the Yellowstone. You might have a really amazing experience looking at a less known park that's in a more rural area. Um, and then you might have a more unique experience that way. Uh, consider only positions that fit your existing skills. You want to be realistic about applying to a project that looks really fascinating, but you just haven't done much work in that area. And hound your references. So your references will receive an independent link in their inbox from our system to provide their letter of recommendation. The only way that you can guarantee that they submit that letter by the deadline is to knock on their door and make sure that they do it. So pound your references. Okay, so this says apply today. If you're not applying today, go on the website and look at these today, and then you have several weeks to put your application together that you want it submitted by Friday, January 24th at 5 o'clock Eastern time, so 3 o'clock Mountain. 
and visit futureparkleaders.org to learn more. And I want to make a quick plug before we move on for other NPS internship opportunities. If you don't see your skill sets represented in the 12 projects that we have available for this year, please check out these other opportunities. The Geoscientists and the Parks and Mosaics and Science internship programs are currently open for student applications to a, a variety of very cool projects. And these other organizations also have um, really interesting internship opportunities. So spread the word about these as well. Okay, and uh, Jessica, I'll turn it over to you now to introduce our special guest, Yvonne. Awesome, thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Yvonne De Jesus Bermejo. I apologize if I didn't say it correctly, Yvonne. Um, Yvonne currently works as a park guide for Great Basin National Park. Um, he was an FPL intern in the summer of 2017, working at Santa Monica Mountain National Recreation Area, where he was responsible to facilitate dialogues about climate change with local communities. Yvonne was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, to two migrant parents with five other siblings. And prior to being an FPL intern, he worked with a nonprofit as a mentor and educator to undocumented youth and youth of color. He intended Hoff he attended Hofstra University in New York, where he received his bachelor's degree in sustainable studies, sustain, sustainability studies. That's a mouth twister right there. Um, and he, as I said, he already, he currently works with Great Basin National Park and he's in a very, very, very small town. Uh, so take it away, Yvonne. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> it's okay. And so again, everybody, my name is Yvonne de Jesus Permejo. I was like, I apologize, I don't have my webcam function. You know, unfortunately, I couldn't figure that out, but you still get to hear my voice. Um, so I was an FPL intern in 2017. I worked at Santa Monica Mountains under then the visual information specialist, whose name was Michael Liang. Um, during that time, I was tasked with doing the responsibilities of working uh, with conducting facilitate dialogues with the local communities about climate change, specifically how climate change could impact them. Um, so back in that time, as you can see now, where Santa Monica Mountains unfortunately had the really devastating wildfire, that was the main proponent of one of the conversations we facilitated. Uh, the main thing though that we focused on, at least the internship did, was creating a connection between the audiences, local communities with the national park resources. Um, so when we were ever doing these structures and these programs, we talked about different ways it would impact them in a manner that they um, was relevant to them. Um, so we didn't necessarily focus on kind of the big arching ideas of like the Arctic melting or anything like that, or um, food scarcity for different types of animals. Instead, we focus on ways that it would impact um, themselves. So one of the things that we did is we talked about how a lot of the issues that they currently face, such as uh, transportation issues, um, costs for bills, housing, electricity, things like that. All of that could be exacerbated by the effects of climate change. We mentioned how the fact that if we continue on the path that we're going towards, we may experience more intense summers that could lead to much more higher electric bills. Or if you don't have the privilege of having electricity um, to be able to have um, AC in your house, then you may experience a lot of heat strokes or heat events like that that unfortunately push a lot of people to visit emergency rooms as their main primary care and can exacerbate the cost of living for them. Um, and so I am so thankful that I was able to get the internship with the future park leaders. Uh, one of the main reasons being is that the work that I did there was such a pivotal moment in my own career opportunities. Prior to the Future Park Leaders, I actually did not consider the National Park Service as a job opportunity. Uh, at that time, I was more looking into going, um, going towards kind of um, studying renewable resources, looking at paleo paleontology actually as well. Um, but then doing the internship, it opened up my eyes. And I spoke about this very passionately that one of my key moments in determining my career for the National Park Service was during this internship program, actually. So part of the internship is to create these events or programs that allow people to kind of talk and have these conversations about climate change. So one of the things we were tasked with doing was we created uh, these seed bomb kind of exercises where we had local community members come in to um, Santa Monica Mountains area 
and we kind of gave them soil, clay, and seed mixtures and things like that. So they were able to create these small little capsules that held seeds and you can kind of throw them into different areas and the clay would break down, the soil would provide nutrients and then as it rained, it would provide the opportunity for the seedlings to grow. And so while we were creating that with the local communities, uh, we started to talk about climate change, uh, but we did it in a way that was very unthreatening. And what we did is we connected the seeds that are growing were going to be really great food sources for the monarch butterflies that kind of go through parts of Santa Monica Mountains. And so we talked about the migration of butterflies and connected that with human migration. Uh, one, of the, one of the most pivotal moments in that uh, conversation was the fact that a lot of the people that were there were these elderly women who are mostly women of color and who many of them have their own stories of migration. Either they migrated themselves from a different country or area and moved to this land, or they have uh, children, relatives, things like that, that have also experienced that sort of journey. And so as we were talking about butterflies and how climate change was affecting their migrational patterns, we started to change the conversation towards human migration um, and how we continue on the track that we're going, we can ex uh, begin to experience climate change refugees who are unfortunately being pushed out from their areas due to the impacts of climate change and being forced to relocate to different areas. And so a lot of the women there share their stories of their migration. Um, and there is a lot of pain and trauma, generational traumas as well, that a lot of them kind of got into. And it was an incredibly moving and healing experience. And that's not something that would have happened had I not got this internship opportunity. So once I got the um, Future Park Layers of Internship, once I completed the program, I still had one more semester before I graduated. So finishing my degree at the end of 2017 in December. Afterwards, um, I got really passionate and wanted to continue my work with the National Park Service. Um, but now I didn't want to do it as an intern, rather as a full-time park uh, ranger. So one of the things I did is using the resources that my supervisor gave me for my internship. Again, his name was Michael Liang. Uh, we kind of created this CV that would be sent out sort of on a mass scale, if you could think of it. He had so many contacts in the National Park Service just from working with him for so long and being so well known and respected across the Park Service uh, that he was able to send out my resume along with my information, sort of the fields that I wanted to work in and send them out to a lot of different parks because with the non-competitive job hiring, direct hiring authority, uh, one of the best things to do is to sort of um, create a lot of connections, as many as you can, and try to stimulate those to be able to lead to some job opportunities. Um, so Michael sent out my resume. It went out across a lot of different national parks, monuments, historical sites, and all of those. And a lot of people reached back, and we started to do interviews. Uh, I started to kind of feel for the areas as to what different parks and places I could potentially work for. And then by April of 2018, a few months later, I landed a permanent gig working as a park guide at Capulin Volcano National Monument. And it's a very, very small national monument located in northeastern New Mexico. Um, so Melanie mentioned earlier about trying to go to places that maybe aren't as well known, not Yosemite or Sequoia or things like that. And so this was a little small monument and I was able to get in as a permanent uh, and have to this day now moved to a different park where I currently am at Great Basin National Park. A lot of times that we just hired our seasonals for this past summer, a lot of them have been doing seasonal gigs for quite a while and they tend to be pretty surprised that I am 20, only 24 years old and I've never worked a seasonal job but instead I came in as a permanent employee right out of college because that's pretty unheard of in the National Park Service. A lot of times people tend to do um, seasonal works and then eventually get there. Um, so I'm always glad and always thankful to the work that I got to do with future park leaders, um, especially all the great work that Melanie and Larry do. And so it was a incredibly moving opportunity. And had I not done that, I would not be on the career trajectory that I am today. Yeah, but that's what I have to say. Thank you so much, Yvonne. That was awesome. Um, and uh, I still, uh, Yvonne told me that migratory butterfly story a while back uh, while interviewing him, and I still love it every time I hear it. So we actually have a lot of time left, um, and 
I'm going to open it up for questions and kind of hope that if there are students out there that would like to answer some burning questions or ask some burning questions and have us answer them, that we can do our best to answer them. So does anybody have anything that they want to ask at this time? Jessica, we have a few that have come in through the questions panel, and we have uh, one and that is coming in. Oh, and there's more coming in. So let's just dive right in. I want to start off with a question from Shannon. Shannon asked a really good question. How do you write a project-specific essay number one if you're applying to three projects with different foci, different focuses? How do you do it? So I can tackle this one. I can try to. This is a really great question. It's very relevant because you have a, very, a limited number of characters to demonstrate how you qualify for three different projects. Generally, what I recommend is to write most strongly to the project to which you think you are best qualified first. Um, and then you can demonstrate how those skills and experience would also strongly qualify you for this project in this way, and then this third project in this way. If you really think that you qualify for three projects, that's the way I would recommend doing it. It sounds a little ha hazardous, but if the goal is to write a really well, a succinct and very clearly written essay that demonstrates your skills and experience for all three projects in which you are applying. And I can tell you that every year, we have one or two students who are in the top candidate pool and are interviewed for more than one project. So it is possible to and to write your essay strongly towards more than one project. Excellent. Thank you, Melanie. We've got a number of questions coming in here that, to my eyes, seem fairly similar. So let me just throw these out here. For example, we've got, um, here we go. Francis asked, have you ever had an urban planning student intern? We've also got Chandler who's asking, would it be appropriate for someone with a public administration degree to apply to the FPL program? And a bit earlier on today uh, in the presentation, we had a question from Jeffrey that says, most projects appear to require biology or earth systems related major. I want, I want you all to understand that um, as far as the work of the National Park Service, broadly, it is highly interdisciplinary. That is to say that we employ a wide cross-section of individuals from many different disciplines, not just the natural sciences, the biological sciences, the physical sciences, but we do employ civil engineers and uh, legal professionals, uh, capacities that you might not typically associate with the National Park System. That said, uh, and, and Jessica and Melanie, I would encourage you to chime in here as well. It's going to be really important for each of you individually to dig into the individual project descriptions for this year and to look at what those qualifications in each one of those position announcements are. They're going to tell you how apropos your current course of study is going to make you competitive or not for that particular position. So dig into each one of the position announcements and really see how well there's overlap between the qualifications asked for and and what you have under your belt or what you're working towards. Does that sound right, Melanie? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And I'd say, uh, just to add on to that, I wouldn't worry so much if your degree title doesn't exactly match the, the field of study listed in the qualifications, but you want to demonstrate and argue that your field of study meets the requirements of the project just as well. So somebody writing the proposal might think, well, I probably need a biology student because we're working on PICA. But if you have like a veterinary degree, I mean, you might very well have the experience if you've got some some field experience in your in your background, et cetera. So you want to be a little creative. The important thing is writing specifically to the project requirements. Awesome. Thanks, Melanie. Sierra has been very patient. Sierra's had her hand up for quite some time. Let's try an experiment. Sierra, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. If you're still with us, go ahead and ask your question. Going once, Sierra. Going twice, Sierra. All right, no worries. Let's look back at the questions panel. We have a number that just came in. Is Audrey asked this, is the internship helpful in getting jobs in parks other than the specific park? Your project is in. And the answer there is absolutely helpful. Understand that by virtue of completing your internship and then your subsequent course of study, you'll be conferred this direct higher authority. It is not 
a guarantee of federal employment, but it is a very uh, good uh, advantage. And you heard Yvonne speak to the fact that people are surprised that he's been able to transition into a permanent job by virtue of being able to parlay this authority. And as Yvonne mentioned, he earned his DHA by working at Santa Monica, National Recreation Area, but parlayed that into a job at two separate parks, right? That is, that is not Santa Monica. So yes, you can take this authority you're granted and apply it towards positions at a number of different parks across the country. So thank you for that, Aldrin. Kyla asks, what are some common mistakes you see on application? Uh, so my favorite common mistake is writing about your passion for a particular park or national parks in general, but not your skill set. I promise everybody has some kind of experience that they can point to related to a project. Um, and also, if you find that you don't have a lot of experience to talk about with the project, then you may not qualify for that particular project. So be honest with yourself about that one. That's my number one. Uh, the other one is not getting your letter of recommendations submitted, because that will make for an incomplete application. And that might be a good segue to ask the question about um, Letters of recommendation. Let's see where did that come. Oh, Shannon's second question. This just Shannon or Jessica. This is a question for you. I think. Uh, do your recommenders only get the email to submit a letter of recommendation when you submit the application? Doesn't seem to send it when you save the application. Correct. So once you've submitted your application through the submittable platform it will automatically send reference letters, uh, re requesting emails of reference letters. Um, now I've already had a couple of people reach out to me and go, well, I put this person as my reference, uh, but then they found out that they are not allowed to write me a reference or they will not be able to write me a reference. Can I change it? So if you email me at fpl at esa.org, um, and just tell me what's going on. I can go into your application, edit it, change your reference, and send the new person an email. Um, it is important that they keep an eye on their junk mail because sometimes the email, because it's coming from a large organization like Submittable, lands in their junk box. And I will also, two weeks before the close of the application period, resend requests for uh, reference letters to any application that has not received both of their reference letters. So I'm giving you guys one last shot to try and get that reference letter in before the close of the application period. Okay. We've got a number, you know, I think, I think we need to go back to the earlier slide that looks at and revisits eligibility because we've got a number of questions in the queue and Clearly, folks are a little bit confused about what makes you eligible, right? As far as your eligibility, if you're graduating this spring and you leave your degree program, you graduated, you finished, you are not eligible for these internship positions unless you are enrolled into a graduate degree seeking program by fall of 2020. That is to say, you must complete the entirety of your internship experience while either currently in or enrolled in a degree seeking program. Melanie, is that? Yes, that's correct. I think that you're close to it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Melanie. Let me unpause that. So here's that slide again. So again, you must complete the entirety of the internship experience while you are either in or enrolled in a degree-seeking program. So that clears things up. Well, Lupe, I know you were asking about that. Uh, Meredith, I know you were asking about that. We had a few other outstanding questions there. Um, and I do want to share via chat, and I will go ahead and do this. And Melanie, maybe you can take a look if there's another question in the interim that you want to go ahead and address. In the chat box, I'm going to chat email addresses for both Melanie and myself, and you are welcome to, after this webinar, direct any additional questions about this to us if you so choose. Okay, I'm going to take this one from a uh, different Shannon. Uh, 
I am an environmental engineer and I am looking at the assessing conditions for coral reef restoration in Guam. And the qualifications say two years of education towards bachelor degree in marine biology related discipline. Am I eligible for this or is there a better project for me? Well, it depends on how many credits you have, but that, what that means in two years of education towards bachelor degree in marine biology or related discipline is that you are you have reached junior level status with the type of application and you are uh, working towards a marine biology or related discipline. And then in your essay, you would want to demonstrate that if you don't have a marine biology major, that the major you have is is um, give, giving you the same set of skill sets and qualifications as a marine biology degree would. If that helps. Um, let's see. Here's a question from Jennifer. Can I apply to all three programs uh, that I talked about during the presentation? Future Park Leaders, Mosaics in Science, and the Latino Heritage Internship Program. Do the internships overlap? The yes, yes, you can apply to all three. Future Park Leaders and Mosaics projects do overlap. They occur at the same time. I am not familiar with when LHIP internships take place but I would definitely encourage you to apply to all three programs. They're all excellent programs. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a question for Yvonne from Raya. I'm wondering what Yvonne thinks helped him stand out in your application for the Santa Monica internship. Awesome. So for my, um, let's see, I'm trying to think back. So one of the things that did stick out a lot, um, and Jessica mentioned it briefly during my introduction, is that I already had a lot of experience doing um, some form of facilitated dialogue. I worked for a nonprofit organization back in San Antonio called Southwest Workers Union, where I uh, facilitated as well as mentored undocumented youth and people of color. So I had that skill set where I knew how to talk to diverse communities. Um, I mean, myself as well. Uh, my parents are migrants from Mexico. Um, so I'm a first generation uh, Spanish speaking person. Uh, one of the other things that also set apart is that for the Santa Monica Mountains job, it was a requirement that you had to be bilingual. You had to be able to speak another language. I believe the options were either Spanish um, Chinese or French, if I'm certain. Um, so that kind of already stuck me out as well because Spanish is my primary language and I didn't learn English till I was in, um, till I was like five or six years old. So having those skill sets kind of edged me forward in that regard. So I was able to be a little bit more competitive with other people also applying for that position. Awesome, thank you for that, Yvonne. And and I will say a number of you have asked, you know, how competitive are these positions? What's the success rate? And I will say it varies greatly. Listen, if you see an advertisement for a summer in Grand Canyon National Park and you find it interesting, so do hundreds of other people. And it's not unusual to get for some of the more popular positions hundreds of applicants. But that said, and this is where you want to dig into the qualifications, you know, there are positions that have special requirements that limit the applicant pool. And Yvonne just mentioned, you know, uh, Spanish language proficiency is a screen out for some projects. We had one project one year that uh, requested that there be speakers of native Samoan. And so we had a very limited applicant pool there. So um, generally, by and large, these are highly competitive positions. So it behooves you to put as much time and effort and consideration and care into the application for positions that you really want as you possibly can. Excellent. So, um, just looking through the other questions coming in, and there are a lot. And and looking at the time crunch that we're up against, uh, we may not be able to get all of them. So again, take note. I put into the chat box email addresses for both Melanie and myself. And if we don't get to all of these, you're welcome to submit these questions by email to us as well. Uh, Margaret asks, is there an advantage to submitting an application earlier rather than later? before the deadline. Jessica, what do you think? Well, if if there were an advantage, it would be just to make sure your reference letters would come through. Uh, 
you definitely, especially when your your references are professors, um, you, you don't want to wait until the deadline and then something happened where they don't get their reference letter in and you're a highly qualified candidate and you don't get the opportunity. But that being said, um, you want to take your time on these applications, uh, especially the essays. You know, uh, the National Park Service leaders in each of these projects is putting a lot of trust into the interns during their time period with them, and they want to see highly qualified, skilled, uh, competitive students that take their role very responsibly. And so, you want to put your best foot forward, and sometimes the best strategy is to start to work on your application and then save the draft, walk away for a little bit and then come back. Maybe you'll see some grammatical errors that you didn't see before, or maybe you wanna change the way that you're answering a question because you see it a little bit more clearly. Take your time on the applications. There's no rush, but you definitely wanna give yourself that window of time so that your references can, can also submit their letters. Thanks, Jessica. And you know, we're getting we're getting a lot of questions about this. If you're a graduate student with professional experience, what's more important to highlight? Danny asked this, but several others have similar questions. What's more important to highlight in our applications? Professional skills or education and coursework? Or is there a, a, a benefit either way? What do you think, Jessica? I have, I have my thoughts. Um, if you can highlight both, I don't see the harm in either. Uh, you know. Sometimes if you say you're a graduate student, and I'll give the example of myself, uh, I was a graduate student and I had a lot of field technician positions available to me. So I could show that I'm proficient at data entry and uh, species identification and working long hours in the field. But if you have some unique talents that came from your education per se, and not necessarily with your job, you wanna find that, that balance in which you can showcase both your ability to work in the hot summer sun and get bitten by mosquitoes, uh, but also that you can have critical thinking um, skills because of maybe some class project that was very unique. Larry, do you wanna jump in and say a little bit more about that or? Yeah, and, and I think you're, you're spot on, Jessica. You know, why not highlight both? Um, you know, take every every character you're afforded within the application portal to try and extol uh, both your academic prowess as well as your professional experience. That said, pay special attention. Everything you put into that application should be guided by the individual position announcement that you are applying to or the several that you are applying to. So pay special heed to the qualifications, pay special heed to the skill sets that they're looking for in those individual positions and be sure that those are front and center within your application package. Um, I did want to address a question I saw here. Someone was asking um, this direct hire authority, how does it differ or is it the same as those offered by the Mosaics in Science program? It is, just so you know, one and the same. It is the same direct hire authority for both programs. And if you're eyeing internships in both, it behooves you to apply for those multiple internships just to hedge your bets. Good question. Um, have a lot of questions here, Jessica, about uh, the letters of recommendation. Who should they come from? Should our letters of recommendation be from STEM professors? Should they come from individuals that are speaking to the disciplines for those projects, or are they really intended to speak to the character of the individual? A few questions like that. We have two letters of recommendation, and I would say that um, the important thing to think about here is, do these people really know you? Um, can they actually write a letter saying that you are a genuine hard worker, that you have you have completed the tasks that you say that you've completed, and they and they would hire you themselves. Anytime you have an opportunity to um, have a reference that can, that personally knows you, not just as a, a friend, but you know, in a situation like if you have a professor who also can attest to your work ethic, that is tremendous. Or if you have an employer who can attest to your, um, your, your goals or long-term commitments, uh, that also is an important reference. I guess what I'm trying to say is 
it doesn't hurt to have both um, and it doesn't you, you, you never want to limit yourself. If you have two references and one can say one thing about you really strongly and the other one can say it in a different way, then that would be best probably. Larry, do you, what do you feel about that? I agree wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Good. Try awesome. and get someone that can speak to both character and skill set. Hey, Alyssa has a question here that's a good one. How long does the DHA qualification last after completing the internship? So remember, you're doing this internship while enrolled in some sort of degree-seeking program. So upon successful completion of both the internship and graduation from your degree-seeking program, the second you graduate, your clock starts ticking. You have two years to be able to use that direct hire authority and parlay that into a permanent position within uh, any one of the federal land, uh, land management agencies under uh, that umbrella. So two years is the answer. And Alyssa asks, is there an option to defer uh, for people considering the Peace Corps post-grad? We've not run into that previously. We'd want to run that up the line with our direct hire authority coordinator. But my suspicion is no, there was probably not. The clock starts ticking, and they're generally pretty firm about this, the second you graduate and you've got two years to make that conversion happen, which is truly a generous amount of time if you're able to, to network and really do the sort of work and have the support that Ivan was talking about with his mentor at Santa Monica Mountains. So hope that answers it, Melissa. Let's see what else we've got here. Man, lots of great questions coming in. This is cool. Okay, are undergrads, Raina, great question. Are undergraduate applicants at a disadvantage to graduate students who apply for the same programs? So you, you need to understand this direct hire authority that we've talked about so much is contingent on the intern completing a rigorous project within the Park Service. And so these projects that we're advertising are truly rigorous in nature in that they demand a high level of not only knowledge and independent thinking, but also execution. And so generally what we find, by and large for these positions, is that um, undergraduate students are perhaps at a disadvantage to graduate students. That said, there are higher level undergraduate students at the junior and senior level that we have seen uh, as competitive. And that's why we really encourage those categories of undergraduate students to look for and potentially apply to these positions as well. If you're a freshman, if you're a sophomore, Better to delay and wait because their chances are you're not going to be competitive against these particular positions. That said, look at mosaics, look at geoscientists and parks. There are opportunities there as well for truly motivated undergraduate students. And along those lines, uh, someone asked, and, and kudos to you for thinking way ahead, when will 2021 positions become available or advertised? Uh, because um, the person asking the question feels they're not uh, able to compete this year. Kudos to you for thinking ahead of the game. We suspect the program will be undergoing a bit of a transformation in the year ahead, but we suspect timelines will be about the same. So all summer internship projects we anticipate will be advertised in December and open for uh, application December into January in future years as well. Thank you for that question. All right. Holy, we have just a ton of questions. You guys are awesome. And again, if anyone wants to bring their voice into the room to ask these themselves, you're welcome to raise your hand, and I'll unmute you. Uh, Jennifer asks, Jessica, how soon will applications be reviewed and positions filled, before the application deadline or after? Well, the applications won't be reviewed until after January 24th. I am the one person who gets to see all the applications as a whole, and then I will divide them up and send them to the parks in which those students have applied. Um, from my understanding, we take about four to six weeks to review applications, and normally we don't announce the internships themselves until mid-March, I believe. Um, I think that's the timeline uh, with internships starting as early as April, but sometimes they don't start until May. It really depends on the timeline, both for the mentor, the MPS supervisor, and also for the intern because of school. Thanks, Jessica. 
That's good clarification. Jennifer asks, what's the review process like? Should we avoid using jargon in our essays? Not sure if the project supervisor will be reading these applications. Well, if I may interject here, Larry, I think that if there is jargon in the particular project announcement, it's safe to say that the jargon that you're going to use is probably going to be interpreted well. Um, for example, one project uses the word eutrophic eutrophication. Now, the only reason why I know that is because I was an environmental studies major. Um, and the person who would be applying for that, if they use that word, which is a very jargony word, I think it would be safe to use it. But if you see plain language, oftentimes the best strategy is to kind of mirror or emulate the same type of language that the project announcement uses. Don't plagiarize, though. Don't do that. <laughs> that advice, I think, is spot on, Jessica. And, and yes, generally the project proponents will be weighing in at some point in the application process. And like Jessica said, if they included that language, chances are they'll want to see that reflected back in answers and applications as well. Couldn't agree more. Um, had a very fun question submitted by Ramon. Have you ever spent a night camping in the Everglades in August? I spent 15 years of my career working in Everglades. Yes, I did. I don't recommend it. Moving on, <laughs> uh, if you cannot Kenna asks, if you attended multiple undergrad institutions, how would you like us to report our GPA? Hmm. Well, um, so I would say that, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I were applying for this internship, I, com I went to community college for two years, and then I transferred in to a four-year degree program. Uh, my for when I transferred in, my GPA started over, uh, and it actually happened to be much higher because I took my junior and senior year much more seriously than I did my freshman and sophomore year. So I would say that you can you can provide your GPA for the current institu institution that you're in uh, if you're an undergrad, um, because that's ultimately going to be your final GPA on your degree. Um, but you will also be asked to submit transcripts. Of, of previous institutions. So even if you're not telling us your GPA, we may still see that, hey, you, you were a C student your freshman and sophomore year because you're giving us your transcripts from your previous institution. Um, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. And if anybody wants to add to that, feel free. Yeah, and I just it just occurred to me, I'm going to, uh, hey, Melanie, I unmuted you momentarily yep. just because uh, I heard a little background noise and I apologize. You've probably been trying to jump in here. Anything to add to that? No, Jessica's got it. You want to provide your current GPA with your current institution, but all transcripts you want to provide for any higher institution, higher educate institution of higher education, because that demonstrates the number of credits you have. Perfect. And Hannah asked one other question that I think is really good. Uh, Melanie, you might want to weigh on this. Do the supervisors for the project decide their hire or is there a committee? Can you repeat that question, Larry? Yeah. Hannah was asking, do the project supervisors decide their hire or is there a committee? There is a committee. The project supervisor is the lead of that committee. And they are the ones who wrote the proposal. So you could consider them the hiring manager with support from uh, a representative from the from the National Park Service Climate Change Program that Larry and I are a part of. And thank you for that, Melanie. Both John and Sage asked some related questions. After the application is submitted. What is the next step? Or when should we expect to receive a response back, whether we're selected or not? Jessica, what do you think? If everything goes according to plan, it should be around mid-March. We'll start announcing who has been accepted for the positions. Yeah. Uh, Sage, once you've submitted the application, it's kind of just hang tight and wait to hear the response back. 
All right. Let's see. I think we've hit the majority of the questions. We're knocking on the door of four minutes. So before we wrap this, I want to reiterate again, if you've not done so already, look in the chat box. And we've got a couple of email addresses there. And if you have subsequent questions, I encourage you to go ahead and uh, email either myself or Melanie Wood. Um, and we will work with Jessica to get those questions answered just as quickly as we can. Um, I think, Jessica, we've answered all the big questions that we've got, so I think we're good to go. Uh, any final words from either you or Melanie before we end this webinar for the day? I would just say that uh, I, I really appreciate everybody joining in on the call today and uh, good luck in the application process. Take your time, uh, double check for errors because we all make mistakes and um, also put, his, put your name out there to many as people as possible. Network, network, network. Yeah, and I just want to add thank you so much for jo and joining. It's really exciting to see this many questions and so many interested in students. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We look forward to receiving your applications and your questions in the wake of the webinar. I saw a few more questions pop in here at the end. We'll try and kick those out to you after the fact. The recording of this webinar will be shared with Jessica, and she will look to post that on the Future Park Leaders website as well for your reference down the line. Thanks so much for sticking with us today. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to you being a future park leader in our parks.